I'm just trying to get the decoration okay. Um, so basically, uh, this is me online. So if you see the picture, equal to this face. And my name online is Billy Bonks. And uh, so just to clarify, uh, the idea of accessibility is that everyone should be able to access any application on the internet, um, regardless of what disability they may have. Maybe cognitive, uh, cog, like thinking slow, let's put it that way, um, like colorblind, no hands, uh, cannot talk and cannot see, like all these things should be covered. Um, and most of the internet is probably not covered because uh, it's not necessarily easy to achieve that. Okay, so the second part is um, achieving accessibility through testing, right? And through testing, I mean, how can we improve the ergonomics of testing um, and be able to achieve accessibility at the same time? So how do we solve the hard problem by making it easier to do something which is actually not solving that problem? So it's a little bit convoluted. Um, okay, so what does it mean to do ergonomic end-to-end -end testing or what is the requirements? Uh, tests should be stable, so if you change the guts of your code and the output is the same, your test should not break. Um, because if your tests break, that's pretty annoying because everything works the same way, right? Um, and for that to happen, it has to be decoupled from the implementation. So if you receive a design, you should be able to write a test for that design without even knowing how you're going to implement that design before you write the test. So this is like the path to test-driven development for web applications. So approaches, approaches that exist at the moment, uh, we have the super old one and the most powerful one, which is CSS selectors. Uh, while CSS selectors are pretty powerful, because you can select anything you want, uh, it's very convoluted. Like if you look at the click handler, um, no one knows what that button is. That's not even valid CSS, but anyways. Um, and it's very coupled to your code. So if you change uh, your CSS, your test will break. Confirm. Um, yes, yeah, so 100% coupled. Okay, so then the solution to that, there were two solutions. One was data test helpers. So in HTML, it's valid to write data dash for any custom uh, attribute you want to add to your tags. And so what that did is that, okay, well, we're not relying on the way the code works. We just add like little annotations around the place. And then we check those annotations when we test and we make sure that they work. So that gave stability. Um, but still coupled to the code somewhat, like you have to know what those tests, what those tags will be when you write the test. Um, and I call it a vestigial annotation because the first thing we do is we strip it from the DOM when we put to production. So we put in all this effort and we don't get anything out uh, for our users. Okay, then Capybara style, uh, I'm sure it exists in other things, but this is what we use at Tregeco for the backend uh, testing. And so this is more ergonomic in terms of the it uses the way that the user will experience the site to do the test. So you want to click the button save, you just click save. And you know, you achieve your goal. So I say it's quite stable because it's your definition of how uh, language is related to a bug or not. So Tregeco, if the label changes, it's probably a bug. And if it's not a bug, then we should update the test because that's the different experience that we're making for the users. Um, it's not coupled to implementation because you can read the design and write the test. And yeah, so the problem is that sometimes it doesn't work and doesn't work as expected. So the experience is not that clean. Um, and then finally, there is an icon here, but it's very light. Uh, I don't know how to change the color. <laughs> um, is page objects. So page objects is a pretty old pattern, also used to resolve CSS selectors. So what it does is it abstracts the DOM into JavaScript objects that your test interfaces with. So instead of having a CSS selector in 20 places, you'll have a CSS selector in one place. And so when that changes, it's easy to fix. And when you read the test, uh, your computer goes into sleep. <laughs> uh, so apparently I need to always give it a nudge, like, don't worry. Okay, so yeah, that's the current approaches. Okay, so now I'm going to cover what it means to migrate. So migration is the journey is about the journey from A to B. So it's about the journey from accessibility to, uh, well, not accessible to accessible. And we're all very used to the refactor process, which is what we use for migrations. We have good tests. We show the errors or we make something which causes all our tests to break. We do the refactoring for fixing those tests. 
and then we uh, smile because everything works, right? So in the case of, uh, I'm going to start talking about this in the case of linters, so like ESLint and those kinds of things. Um, basically, you'd enable a rule and all your tests would break and then you'd fix those areas uh, or ignore parts of it uh, to have a well linted app. Okay, so now we get to introducing of semantic testing, right? Um, okay, so what is semantic testing? Uh, if we want to access a UI element in a test, we do so as if we we're using a screen reader, right? So we are interacting with the page um, as a user would and less powerful user because we don't have like cognition and eyes. So as a user that's interacting with the page from a screen reader, right? Um, and so this is what ensures that we are able to test whether your app is usable from a screen reader or not because we implement the same specification uh, defined by HTML. Um, the W3C. Okay, uh, one more little extra piece here, which is expressing constraints, relationships, and processing instructions in a less powerful language increases the, the flexibility with which information can be reused. The less powerful the language, the more you can do with the data stored in that language. So, the most powerful language is CSS selectors, and the least powerful language is using the word save, right? And so, in between save and the actual DOM element, there's a lot of information that, has, that exists. And that information can be used to uh, optimize your code or run checks on your code. Like, oh, sorry, like this was a mistake that you did. It works, we'll let you do your test and continue on. But if you want to actually get accessible, you need to resolve these uh, errors which we store for you. Um, and you can configure. Okay, so there is a little bit of current art on the project. Um, so this comes, uh, we use at Tregeco, we use uh, Rails and Ember. And so I initially built it for Ember, for the Ember community. So it's under a package called Ember Semantic Test Helpers. Um, and then I extracted uh, Semantic DOM Selectors, which is the engine that converts save into an HTML element. And I extracted QUnit Semantic Assertions, um, also from Ember. Uh, from the Ember package, which uses uh, semantic DOM selectors to make assertions which test the semantics of the application and its accessibility uh, in terms of text and annotations. Um, yeah, there was, a, at some point, there's going to be, there should be some architecture diagram. Okay, so if we take the following code, we have a login wrapper and a login input, which is a label, uh, well, a label that's targeting a login input, and that label is email, the input is the input, and then when you click the login button, you will end up on the pe second page there, which is article, section, um, etc. So the way you would write the test with the classes is you would select, you would say, okay, we'll fill in login wrapper input, and the test will go and fill that in with that value, um, and then click this button, and then assert that the correct CSS is on the page. That means we've done the transition successfully. Um, but this is, uh, is going to break when you change the CSS. And if what's interesting is like as you scale, uh, like teams, at some point someone that's completely not part of this code has to read this test and they won't really necessarily understand. Like this is a simple one, but sometimes it can get quite complicated. Uh, so the idea is to change that to English so it reads like a story, um, which is a bit BDD style, behavior driven development. Um, so we go fill in email. Uh, Alice, that example, click the login button and assert the section. So on the second example here, we have a lot of things going on. Firstly, the fill-in helper will make sure that the thing that you're filling in is semantically correct. Uh, is semantically correct. By semantically correct, I mean it, the tag that you're using and the way you've decorated your tag with attributes actually conveys what it is. Because the way it's conveying itself is the way a screen will, will, will announce it. It will be like button. Login, do this to click the button. And if it's not really a button, it's not going to do that action for the user. Uh, click will assert that it's a button um, and that the text is there. And then assert.section uh, dashboard exists, asserts that you're using the correct section element. It asserts that the heading is correctly bound to the section with the correct tags and that it exists. So we've actually asserted many more things on this section than we have on this section. Okay, and also just to bring a little bit of migration in here, is that the current tooling is very black and white. Okay, you're either accessible or you're not accessible. 
and in order to do a migration to migratory path you would have to keep you know checking it out or add extra tests specifically for accessibility and since we want to improve ergonomics we actually want to remove the concept of accessibility from engineers while they're writing features um, and then be able to turn on those concepts from the background as needed um, so that's why it's all hidden away under the covers um, yeah okay so this is the architecture diagram I was talking about. So we have uh, some of the packages, <laughs> the relations. So we have Ember Semantic Test Helpers, which takes both semantic DOM selectors and QUnit semantic assertions. And it's got its own uh, infrastructure to actually do the full flow from finding an element to acting on the element. Um, and then we use QUnit DOM, which basically semantic assertions proxies the elements that found from the finding engine to an as DOM assertion engine. Um, and inside the Ember Semantic Test Helper in, uh, package, there's an engine which is about actors. So we have finders and we have actors. So the finders is the DOM selectors, which is the screen reader part. But once the element is found, uh, it needs to be acted upon, right? So, you know, probably the most interesting component is the select box. No one enjoys using the original select box of HTML. And so we all write our own select boxes. And actually getting that to be semantically correct is very difficult. So there's a lot of work to be done and research that needs to be done in how to do it properly so that we can build an acting engine which will be able to walk the DOM tree based on the correct uh, attributes and also fall back to common mistakes to help improve. Like, uh, by the way, you need to do this and that uh, to actually do the acting properly. Right now, it only works really well for like inputs and buttons. Um, and roll input and roll button, yeah? Okay, so this is sort of the back end of what the testing API is. So it's a configuration, right? And the configuration is inspired from uh, linters where you can say, okay, I want like this preset, which is a more babble, if anything, um, or you inherit from this rule selection. Um, so for example, the first one is area compliant. So if your app is not area compliant, Anything that it, like, for example, if you label, if your label targets the four attribute, targets the input, that is correct. But if your label, the four attribute targets a div, which has input inside of it, that is absolutely wrong. Um, and we try to, like, make backup plans so that we don't stop your productivity and your ergonomics while giving you a path to get to the correct result. Um, so that will be in the second uh, configuration here where we have um, invalid for relationship is that rule. And you can toggle these 0, 1, and 2, or error, uh, warning, or silence, uh, also exactly from the defined as ESLint. Um, and you can configure these different uh, rules. So there's also a one-to-one -one mapping with the finder to a rule. So if you install the finder, you would be able to configure that finder, and there would be like options to configure it um, as needed. And Here's an example. We had a test, and I just made the test uh, invalid. And so um, basically the control, scan or type barcode ID, was found through an invalid label for relationship. And this one, I put the error level to zero so that it would actually throw errors. Um, this allows me to fix those errors and then uh, go back to green. So we go back to that refactor uh, circle of life. Um, and if I don't want to have errors right now, but I would like to know if anything's wrong, we can just log to console. Um, and then finally, the last one is silence, where you wouldn't even know you did anything wrong, but you're at least able to code fast and have an enjoyable time. Uh, so to summarize all of that, um, the key features are config configurable and extensible. Um, it's decoupled from the implementation. So with the first key feature, we solve the problem of Kabibara where it doesn't always work, and sometimes you like hit walls. So solve that problem. Uh, it's not coupled to the implementation, so we can do TDD, solve that problem. Um, the annotation that we're creating, instead of data test, which we strip away straight away, we annotate using uh, HTML attributes of like accessibility and semantics, which is useful annotations, because now our apps are becoming more um, accessible. And then, uh, yeah, so stable as in like, for us, you know, changing the word save to don't save is a bug. Um, so your test shouldn't break unless you change the text on the, t on the page. And you can resolve the stability if you don't like it that much with page objects, which I previously explained. 
Um, yeah, okay, so I have implemented this at TradeGecko and what successes have I found from this process? Um, firstly, our teams are now much closer to be able to write in TDD, so write the test first, then build the app. And this will, in, this will have, help them enjoy uh, faster feedback cycles um, versus like waiting for things to get rebuilt slowly and pages to load and servers to communicate. Um, we have useful annotations. So even though accessibility is not important to TradeGecko, our app is actually becoming accessible by accident. Um, and within the culture, we have a culture of semantic code and accessibility code which is important, like just how we learned our JavaScript, you know, we put a comma here and a curly there and a space there. Um, we need to make sure that we don't, that we get out of this hole of divs or HTML because divs are generic and they mean nothing. Um, and so having this here, people now actually think, oh, what is the semantic of my document? What does this tag mean? What does that tag mean? How, do I, how would a, someone that's blind like access this? So all in all, it makes us write better code and better programs um, for free. Okay, so, not everything is good. Uh, the downfall is that, um, so there's three different ways to become accessible and you actually get like, well, I don't know if you get a certificate, but you have to like meet some compliance uh, for different levels, which is the A level, double A level and triple A level. Triple A level is the hardest, A is the easiest. So if you look through those compliances, um, what we are asserting is only a small subset of that. Um, so to actually use this as like a truth for an app, and through testing right now is not totally possible. Um, these numbers are totally made up. I have no idea what percentage is covered, but I just know it's like probably not more than 50%. <laughs> um, okay, so, so from that, it's like, okay, well, that's good. We have ergonomics, um, but what moonshot ideas can we use to actually push that number to the top of that barometer, I think it's called. Um, so the idea I have is for visitors. So previously we discussed uh, finders and actors, where the finder would get the thing and give it to the actor. So now we have a visitor pattern where uh, the finder will find something and visitors will have an option to visit that object before it gets given to the actor. When they visit that object, they can assert something. So for example, I making a test, click button save. Um, the finder will find the save button and then the visitor will be like, I'm looking for any button. So it will match to the button and then the visitor can assert the color contrast between the foreground and the background of the button. And then it can make like, oh, by the way, like your color contrast is not correct. And then that gets passed to the actor and then the actor acts on it and you've written your test. Um, you haven't actually changed your testing code. You've just installed a package in the config file, like an extra visitor uh, to, get a, to get that assertion. And then that would help us actually complete that bar. Um, and then more extreme than that, I was told to put many seats to make it funny. Uh, but we have like LCOV, which is lines of coverage uh, for seeing how much our thing is tested. So we could actually probably, with all this information, we could build like accessibility coverage uh, uh, sheets or reports, which can be used. And then you can do things like on your CI, make sure that your percentage of accessibility coverage doesn't decrease. So at least you stay at the same level. Um, so that's that. And then, uh, so basically the roadmap, this is more like if this interests anyone or if you know anything about accessibility, like I'd love to have some conversations. So I've built it for Ember. Um, so a lot of work to do there. I've extracted the engine so that we can use this engine on any framework that's available, even no framework. And then the dot, dot, dot is because I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, uh, please like, I don't know how much time we have afterwards, but give me a card or take my card, send me an email. Uh, and we can talk about that. And then finally, I have to plug and uh, so <laughs> we're always hiring. Uh, our stack's like JS Ruby, but if you do PHP, like feel free to apply. <laughs> um, and yeah, my presentation, like the template was sponsored by TreyGecko, so that's why there's branding everywhere. It looks pretty nice. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much. No questions. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's just me, but I couldn't bridge the gap between like writing semantic code and, and as a byproduct making your coders make things a bit more more accessible. Mm -hmm. what, what happens in between? Okay, so um, in between from the user side or from the developer side? Uh, from the developer side. 
Okay, so basically you would do something like um, assert.input, for example. Um, I think it's just one second. Yeah, so like, for example, this is the, the in-between part, I suppose, right? So if, you, if your input, like an extreme example, let's say you, made, you wanted a circle input, right? And you, that doesn't exist in HTML, so you make a div. And then you'd have like on key events in that div where someone types in and it like would sort of fill in the circle. Um, but now the problem is that a div is meaningless to a screen reader, mm -hmm. right? The screen reader will just be like, oh, it's a div moving along, um, pretty boring. Um, but if you put like, for example, like role text area, this, that, that converts the div into a text area from a semantic point of view. So the semantic is what that object is on the DOM and how a robot or screen reader would interpret that, that item. Um, another example for like, let's say SEO, right? You make your link actually like a span because of some styling reason, and you don't put the correct semantic uh, uh, decorations on that, like roll link or something, then the robot would just skip over that. Oh, this is not a link. But actually, if the robot had theoretically clicked it, and you want them to click it so that they can navigate through your whole site, um, so what we're doing is we're asserting that this is an input and we're asserting or we're asserting this is fillable like a text area input, a select box, a radio theoretically. Um, and then we're clicking a button so we're asserting that it really is a button. We may, are you, are you sure this is a button? Yes, it is a button. Um, and we are asserting that this is a section and that the section has an H1 in it and the H1 is connected to the section through like area label by and like IDs. So that would be in the ideal case where we are area compliant. But given the fact that we are probably not, which is like the sore truth, I think, like it's a bit of an assumption, um, we have fallbacks, right? So if you made a mistake here, we have strategies to help you fix that mistake. And if you have mistake, a common pattern mistake that we haven't like provided a solution for, um, you can either make a package or like commit to our repo or just in your app, you can make custom finder that finds a common mistake. Um, because we don't want to stop productivity while we provide a path and like a to-do list to how to make your app accessible at the same time. Does that make sense? Uh, and for, for example, your um, things like email login, is this standardized? Or? Oh, well, this is just the text on the page. Mm -hmm. So if, if I was testing this app, mm -hmm. so this is the app, right? And the app has got an input, which is labeled by email. So if this was wrapped, yeah, if this was in a div and that thing targeted the wrong thing, if any of this was wrong, it wouldn't be IRA compliant. This is pretty much IRA compliant. And how do you distinguish between texts? Um, in terms of difference between login and email. I mean, if there's like login and login and login. Okay, so that in raises an interesting, different kind of a point, which I didn't include in this because of time constraint. But um, uh, there's a concept called inclusive design. Um, and for certain areas, if you have multiple login buttons, um, one could argue that that is a bad design for someone that doesn't have eyes, mm -hmm. right? Or someone that is cognitively impaired, because you would have to like connect the buttons to visual indicators as to what they do. Um, so maybe it would be better to actually write it differently. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to stop ergonomics. So we have like ideas, for example, within uh, a within helper. So you could go within to find a section and then within that block you could say click this button because we don't want to stop productivity at the same time. But it's all working off like English. Yeah? Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.